Hello and welcome to the Blue Open Studio tutorial video series. The topic of this video will be project configuration. In this video, we will be discussing the various project configuration features and settings, where these features and settings are located in the software, and we will demonstrate changing the various project settings, running the application as a service, configuring the BOS tasks startup options, adding background images to screens, and changing the screen layout. The first item we are going to look at are the project settings. And these allow you to configure the general settings that affect the overall project. These settings will include the project information, such as the description or author, changing the license or tag level, the database and alarm and history formats, the viewer or runtime settings, such as a resize board or virtual keyboard, configuring our communication and tag integration settings, and numerous preferences, such as warning messages and quality feedback. To access the project settings, in development, we'll go up to the menu ribbon and click on the project tab. Now these five buttons in the settings group from information to preferences will all bring up the same settings dialog just in different locations. So I'll click on information and we bring up the project settings dialog and we see on the left hand side here, a list of items that match what we saw here on the project menu ribbon. So on the information tab, we see here that we get our documentation information. This is things mostly when someone wants to look at the project and see who might have created it, what exactly it does, an available revision number, things like that. We also see that our application path is automatically entered in here. Unfortunately, we cannot use tags in here to increment these. So for example, the revision, we would have to manually increment every time we save the file or make a change. Uh, we also have a field down here for notes if we want to put in any additional information that we might not be able to fit here. Under options, this is where we can come to change our target system or the license level. Right now we have it set for Windows Blue Open Studio Machine Control, which is the 1500 tags, because we have a description right below. If I wanted to change this to say supervision or line management, I could change it here. And now my application is configured for that tag level. Now keep in mind, anything that you select here will depend on what license you have loaded into the system where the application will be opened. So if you have a license loaded in that cannot open a 4,000 tag application, you could come here and change it back or change it down to machine control. However, if you have above 1,500 tags being used in the application, you will get a message stating that. We have a resolution here, which unfortunately we cannot change through this. In order to change this, we would have to modify the APP file manually. And then below that, we have our format for our alarm history and events. So we can change it between proprietary database and binary. And then we can also configure our databases for alarms and events, and then any custom fields that we might need. For more information about this, please refer to the alarm and trending and event tutorial videos. Then we have the option down here for configuring our default database. And this is where we can come to set up the default connection that we can use throughout the application. And for more information on this, please refer to our database connectivity tutorial video. Then under performance control, we see here where we can limit the amount of free memory that the application can take up from our system. And then data protection, this will allow us to set a password for the entire application, meaning that the application cannot be opened and it cannot be saved or reloaded or downloaded without this password being entered in. And then under viewer, this is where we come to configure how the runtime looks. And for this application, we have it set for a title bar. The start maximize field is unchecked. 
meaning that this will start in a window mode and we have a resize border so we could resize our window to fit our application so if you want to come here and say put a title bar with the close and min and max boxes along with the menu we can do that we can also set our startup screen here as well as coming over to screens and right clicking on one and then we have the option for show question marks when quality is not good this is typically used if we lose communication to a plc so instead of showing stale values, we can show question marks when we have a communication loss. And then there is this disable palm rejection. What that means is with touch screens, if we put our whole hand on the screen, it will reject or prevent that touch. And then enabling tool tips, saving pictures in separate files. These are user preferred how you want these to set up. They don't really affect how the application operates just determines whether or not we have tool tips that pop up and if we save pictures into separate files or into a single location. And then the auto screen scaling. We go over this in more detail in the opening and closing screens tutorial, but what this allows us to do is when we resize our runtime window, it will automatically scale our screens to best fit the runtime window. With this unchecked, it leaves them at the default size. And then off on the right hand side, we have active area indication. If we want to show an object edge, we don't change the mouse cursor depending on if we touch over something. Instead of just being an arrow, we could have like that finger pointer or a text entry bar. And then the virtual keyboard. This allows us to set the default virtual keyboard for the application. Uh, by default, this is unchecked. So when you check this and you select your default here, this will allow us to determine which keyboard pops up automatically. Now this can be changed in each specific object that requires input or requires a keyboard for use. And then we have the hint for the virtual keyboard and then if we want to enable min and max fields and multi-line input. And then the zoom ratio for built-in dialogues which auto will depend on the size of the screens with auto screen scaling and then we can give it a static percentage. And then we have options down here if we want to show the mouse cursor or not. And the execute topmost object commands, if we have multiple buttons or multiple items with command animation layered on top of one another, do we want that touch to drive through and activate all of them or just do the very top one? And then use pop-up input for text objects. So instead of us having the cursor on the text object, it will pop up a little window for us to enter it in, similar to what the keyboard does. And the last item is use.scr extension for screen files. The .scr extension was used in previous versions of the software. However, it was also used for screensaver files. And Security softwares, antivirus, firewall utilities, things like that, found problems with these. They found vulnerabilities. So in order to prevent the application from being flagged by one of these, when version 8.0 came out, they changed the extension used from .scr to .scc. However, if you want to go back to that, we can check this box, and now they will use the .scr extension instead. And this is mostly here for legacy purposes for compatibility with older versions. We recommend if you're creating new applications that you stay with the .scc file extension. And then down here we have the multi-touch settings. And these are just the configuration settings for the min and max and how our multi-touch gestures behave. This doesn't necessarily disable them except for up here. So we can disable our multi-touch by coming here and clicking on no. But by default they're disabled with these settings. And then under communication, we have down here at the bottom our tag integration, which for more information on that, please refer to the tag integration tutorial video. We have our driver and OPC, whether we want to send just the last state or every state whenever a value changes. And then the TCP port and send period. And this is for our TCP IP worksheets. So for more information on that, please refer to the TCP IP communication tutorial video. And then options for preloading tags from the server. And this is for, once again, the TCP IP worksheets. 
timeout when executing it on the remote station on local and then for the execution environment what is the timeout for an error for the execution and then if we want to enable file compression in order to help us save size on our storage for the application and then finally under preferences we have a couple of different groups warning messages and we want to display warning messages not only during runtime but also for development so most of these are for development though display warning messages before downloading the screen to the target system confirmation message so normally you will get the option when the message first pops up if you want to hide this message if you decide that you don't want to hide them you can come here and uncheck them and then it will display them again every time you will then get the option when it comes up to again hide it if you want and then quality feedback service is probably the most important section in the project settings under the preferences and what these do is this allows us to create a log and dump files and also log the memory when the application itself has a crash and that is either during runtime or development and I recommend one of the first things that you do is when you configure an application and we're starting to use it and you really start developing deploying troubleshooting things like that you come here and you check these four boxes especially the enabled detailed dump files because if you have repeated crashes of your application these files will be necessary in order for technical support to troubleshoot what's going on and those are located in the application directory so I'm going to go into my app directory into the web folder and this dump folder underneath it and right now we see that we have a few here and this is simply because it automatically makes a dump file and it automatically will log the memory when I have this box checked so I would come here and check these and it's okay after a while to delete older files because they will especially with the detailed dump files become very large and it can take up quite a bit of room uh, so it is good to clean those out occasionally and then down below we have an option for reset tags database when starting a project for more information about exactly what resetting the tags database does please refer to the testing and debugging tutorial video however if we want to automatically do it every time the application starts we can check this box so if we want our tags to de reset to a either startup or zero value we can check this box and so every time the application starts it will like it's starting for the first time so the next three are for thin client connections and the behavior of not only the thin clients themselves, but also the local program. So the first one will enforce web functionality on the local screens. And what that means is it will make the local project screens look like what the project screens appear on the thin client side. And auto reload project on the viewer web clients when it's changed what this will do is if we change the application locally and we save and we republish then it will automatically reload the screens or the project on our thin clients when it detects that they were changed and disable high quality when resizing bitmaps to improve performance this works not only with the thin clients but also with the auto screen scaling so if we have high resolution or high quality bitmaps or images on the screen, it will try to resize those or resize the window. Well, that will sometimes slow down how the graphics get redrawn when we're resizing. So we can check this box and it will actually load a lower quality of the image, which will make it much easier to resize and to display those uh, during runtime, not only locally, but also on our thin clients. And for more information on these three, please refer to our Thin Client Connectivity tutorial video. And last but not least is our default project path. And this is what the default path is where every single application will be saved automatically. So when we first create an application, it'll come up with the path. And this is the path that it enters in there. So if we want to change what this is, we can click browse and we can change it to something else. For example, if we want to go directly to the C drive or if we want to go to a network connected drive where everything's stored off on a separate server, we could browse to it through here. And that will 
be the default directory that is selected when a new program is created. One thing to note is that this default project path is not specific to this application. It is specific for the entire software, not just the app that's loaded. Additionally, these warning messages up here are also for the software itself, not the application. However, the quality feedback service and the four checkboxes below that are specific to the application. The next item we will look at is the service. And your Blue Open Studio project can be configured to run under Windows as a service. This means that the application will start as soon as Windows completes booting, and it does not require someone to log into Windows. Uh, this is useful for server applications where it may be unattended when the server restarts. And this will then allow the runtime to begin. To access the service configuration in development, we'll go to the menu ribbon, click on the project tab, and on the settings group here, all the way to the right will be service. If we click on that, we'll bring up the service configuration dialog. And here we can browse to an application, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the one we even have open in development. But I will browse to our training application. And then I can also put in a user and password. And this is dependent on whether or not we have security configured and what users or groups have rights to start the runtime. So if I have security configured and I have certain users that are allowed to be the only ones to start up the application, I would have to put in the username and password here. Then we have a startup type. Do we want it automatic, manual, or disabled? And what this is, is this is similar to how you set up the services through Windows, which we'll look at in a second. So normally, if you're configuring your application to start as a service, you want to have automatic selected. However, if you select manual, it will still enter this application in as a service, but you have to manually start it through the services, be it through the services dialog or through a command prompt or batch file, something like that. And then disabled will enter in the application as a service, but it will not allow you to start it up until you change it from disabled. And then once we do that, we can come here, down here under action. And right here it says service status, service not found. So we first would have to apply like this. It says configuration completed. If I click OK, now I'd be able to start and stop the service from here. So now that we have the service configured, let's take a look through the Windows services configuration for it. So I will bring up a run box. So I'll open a run box and then I'll type in services.msc. Now we'll open our services window. So I'll expand it. And then I will expand out the name column so we can see it a little better and also the description. And I will scroll down until I see Blue Open Studio. We see Blue Open Studio version 8.0. We don't see a description. We see that set to automatic. So if I right click and go to properties, it comes up with the properties dialog here and we see all the settings that we have, which are a little more than what we were able to set in our services dialog through the software. We see the path to the executable, which is the service executable and its startup type. And then we see our status. And here we can also start, stop, pause, and resume the service, and then also set our startup type if we wanted. And then we see our options for logon, recovery, and dependencies. The one thing you do not see through here, though, is an option for configuring or selecting what application is used for this. That is because that is done through this stdsvc.exe file. That is the executable that is indicating what application to actually start. So we'll close these, come back in. And one thing to note here, when configuring your application to run as a service, there are several modules in Blue Open Studio that run when an application actually starts. The two major ones are studiomanager.exe, which are all of the background tasks. And the second is viewer.exe, 
which is the visualization or the actual viewer, the GUI. When you start the application as a service, the background tasks, the studio manager.exe runs. However, the viewer does not. You will have to start the viewer manually. There are several different ways to do this, most of them through the tasks settings, which we'll discuss here shortly. However, some of it also requires using a secure viewer thin client in order to connect locally to the application to view the runtime. And we discuss that in the thin client connectivity video. So please refer to that on how to set up the thin client for this. The other issue is that through development, even if we open it with the application, we're not actually connected to it. So the output window and database spy will not bring in information from the application that's running. We have to use the remote ones through remote management. And please refer to the remote management tutorial video on information for that. So if you're going to start your application as a service, there are several other steps you have to take in order to replicate the same type of functionality that we've seen so far throughout the tutorial videos. Those being bringing up the viewer or visualization for the application and using the troubleshooting tools, specifically the database spy and the output window. And lastly, if you want to remove your application from starting as a service, all you have to do is come up to the application, clear out the application field along with the user and password fields if they have any data entered in, then click apply. You'll get configuration completed, and now we have stopped the application from starting as a service. The next item we're going to look at are tasks. And we can use the Execution Tasks tab to configure which execution tasks and runtime modules will be automatically started when the project runs. Additionally, we can use built-in functions such as Start Task and End Task to manually start or end these tasks at runtime as well. To access the Tasks settings, in Development, on the Menu ribbon, make sure you're on the Home tab. And under local management here, you'll see tasks. If we click on that, it'll bring up the project status. And here you see the numerous tasks that are inside of Blue Open Studio. And then you'll see a status column and the startup. Right now, since we don't have the application running, the status column is blank for all of them. And the startup will tell us either automatic or manual. What that means is if it's automatic, the task will automatically start as soon as the project is started. Manual requires us to start it up ourselves. So the big one here is viewer. And this is the visualization, the GUI for the application. And it is by default set to automatic. However, we can change this and set it to be manual and start up our viewer at a later time. And we'll show you how to do that here in a little bit. So I'm going to close my tasks, and then I'm going to start my application. And then I'm going to snap my application to the right side of the screen, snap my development to the left. And I am going to go down to the output window, right click and select settings. And we get into more details about these log settings in the testing and debugging tutorial video. But for now, I'm going to check the field read commands and click OK. And what this will do is this will put status messages of how our driver is able to communicate to the device. In this case, we see a lot of connection errors. So for example, we're troubleshooting an application. And the issue that we're troubleshooting has nothing to do with the driver. But we don't want to remove the driver or we don't want to disable it. We can actually turn off the driver task. So if I come up to development while the application is running and I click on the tasks button, it'll come up. And now, as a side note, we see on the status column which ones have started and which ones have not. And the one we want to look at is the driver runtime. So if I select it and come over here and click stop, we see that the driver runtime has stopped and our messages in the output window have also stopped. That's because the driver is no longer running. I can come back here again and click start. Driver starts up and here we go again, resuming the status messages. 
Additionally, as I mentioned before, we could stop the viewer or the visualization from automatically starting. So I will stop my runtime and back in development, I'll first go into my settings and remove the field read commands just so we can clear that out. And then I will come to my tasks again under local management. And then for viewer, I will select it and then go to startup. And now we see in this little dialog, we have the option between automatic and manual. So I will click manual, click OK. Now we see that it shows manual, so I'll click OK. And then I will start up my runtime. And we see that the runtime has started because we see our status meshes down here for our driver. And we see our two tags here in the database by changing, but there's no visualization. It's because our viewer task has been set to manual. So as I stated, there are a couple of different ways to start the viewer manually or start a task manually. So I will come to the database spy and I'll use the built-in function start task. And inside of parentheses, I will put in viewer in double quotes. And now we see that the visualization has come up. This type of delay startup for the visualization is very useful if you need the application to do some preparation before we see any screens. So I will stop my runtime and I will show you another way to do that. And then I will go to the tasks tab on Project Explorer. And I'll expand script and open up the startup script. And for more information about what the startup script does and how VB scripting works, please refer to the scripting tutorial video. But the startup script will run once when the application first starts. So what I will do here is I will put in that built-in function we just used. So I'll hit the dollar sign to bring up the autocomplete. And I'll start typing and it says start and I see start task is selected. So I will enter in my task name viewer then I will save and now when I start you see that it automatically brought up the viewer just like it did normally with the viewer task set to automatic so we could set this up to be triggered based off of a certain condition say after we preload some values in or we finish composing some tags or whatever else it is that we need to do, then we can start our viewer based on a specific condition and it doesn't necessarily have to start up as soon as the application begins running. And lastly, we'll look at the screen layout. You can use this to visualize how the screens are arranged at runtime and then also use it to maneuver around the screens, resize them and even place them in specific locations. This also allows you to reuse the screens in multiple layouts if necessary. So we will now look at how screens can be laid out in the application. And there are a few different ways to manipulate how screens open and close and where they're located. Uh, for more information about how you can create and configure screens at our initial startup locations, please refer to our opening and closing screens tutorial video. For us though, we are going to create a new screen here and we're going to also create a pop-up window that that screen will display. So the first thing that we'll do is in development on the Project Explorer, we'll go to the graphics tab, expand our screen list, and we'll open our template screen. And then we'll save this screen as a new screen. So we come up to our application menu and click Save As, and the name we're gonna give it is Plastic. So on the screen, we're gonna use an image as the background. So I will right click on the screen and go to Screen Attributes. And then we see here under the description, this background picture. We're going to check the box for Enable Background and we are going to change that from a BMP to a JPG. And that's all that we have to do as far as the screen attributes is concerned. So we'll click OK. And it says that it was not found. 
And that's because we see here our path and the file is not there. So what we'll do next is I will open an Explorer window and I'll navigate to my training files folder. And then I'll navigate to the screen subfolder and we'll see plastic.jpg. I will copy that and paste it into the screen folder of my application directory. And now if I come back to the screen, I close it, saving as I do, and then I open it again. We now see that we have our image as the background of the screen. And how this works is because we have the same name for the screen as we do for the image. We name the screen plastic, and then in Windows Explorer, we can see that we have an image called plastic.jpg. So when we went into the screen attributes here, we just told it what file extension to look for. And then as long as we have a file with that extension with the same name as the screen in the screen subfolder, it will automatically use that screen as our background image. So now that we have that configured, we're going to place two buttons down on the screen. So I'll come up to my active objects, click on button. I'll draw one here, and then go into the properties. And I will change the caption to read motor. And then I will click on command animation. And then on the command animation, I will go to the on up tab. And I'll change this from VB script to open screen and I will type in pop-up, all one word. And then I will copy the button. And to do that, I hold down the control key, select the item, and then while I'm holding the mouse button and the control key, I drag it away, and then I release the control key first, and it makes a copy. And then in the settings for this, I'm going to leave the caption at motor, but I'm going to change our command animation. And I'm going to change it from open screen to built-in language. And for the expression, I'm going to use our open built-in function. And for more information on this, please refer to the scripting tutorial video. So open, and then inside of parentheses and double quotes, I'll put in the name of the screen pop-up. And then I will close the double quote comma, and now I'm going to put in the location, the coordinates at which we want the screen to open. So I will type in the starting coordinates, which is the upper left-hand corner, so 250, comma, 250, and then the ending coordinates, which is the bottom right-hand corner. So 700, 700. So your expression should look like that. Now we need to create the pop-up screen. So instead of copying the template screen, I am going to right click on my screen folder here and select insert. And in the description, I will be changing the size and location. So I'll change the size to be 300 for the width and 300 for the height. And then for the location, I'm going to make the top 175 and the left 175. And that is because I want this pop-up to come up on this screen and not the header or the navigation. And I'll change the style from replace partial to pop up. And then I will click OK. And then on the screen itself, I'm going to just place two items. The first is going to be a link symbol. So on the graphics tab, I'll go to the symbols. And I will navigate to motors. And what I want is motor 12. So I'll click on it to select it and go back to my screen and drop it on the screen and just center it as best I can. 
And for more information on how linked symbols work, please refer to our linked symbols tutorial video. I will double click on it, make sure that for the tag state property, I have the value blink slow, which should be in there by default. And then lastly, I will place a button to close the screen. I'll place this button here, come in, change the caption to close, and then click on the command button to enable the animation. And then I will go to the on up tab and change the type to close screen and then type in pop-up. So now we have our screen configured. I will click on the close button and it'll ask me to save it and I'll say yes and I'll give it a name pop-up. I'll close my symbols, close my plastic screen, saving it as I close it. And the last thing we need to do is add that button to our navigation. So I'll go to my Navigation 2 screen, copy the FTP button, and change the necessary information. The open screen I'll change to plastic, and I will click back to button and change the caption to plastic. I will save all and then close my navigation screen. So now I will start up my runtime. And then I will snap my runtime to the right, my development to the left. And then in my runtime, I'll go to my plastic screen. And we see that we have our image that shows up. And if I click on the left hand button, we see that we get our pop up window coming up exactly where we want it to, just inside of the plastic window. And with the blink slow tag configured there, we see that the color is flashing for the motor. So now I will close this window and click on the second motor button. And now we see that it is located in a different spot and it is much larger. That is because of how we set up the open function for the second button. We gave it different coordinates and different size because we gave it a start and end coordinate of 250 to 700, we now have a much larger window. This one is configured for a width and height of 300, where the 250 to 700 is a 450 width and height. We see the window is larger, however, our button and our motor did not change spots. We'll click close. And what I will do here is I'll come back into the development. And in this case, I will maximize it because we will show you now how to use the layout to modify how screens look and where they're located during runtime. So if I go to the project tab, I don't see it. Go to insert, don't see it. That's because it's on the graphics tab and we can only see that tab if we have a screen open. So what I will do is I will open my plastic screen. And now on the graphics tab, we see layout here. If we click on that, we see where our plastic screen will be laid out in the runtime window. And it will only show the screens that are open in development. So what I will do here is I will open my other screens, my header and my navigation too. And now if I go back to my layout, you see that it's updated with the screens that I have open. Where these are located are fine. However, we want to change where the pop-up screen appears. So I'll open my pop-up screen and then go back to my layout. And we see that it's here. So what I can do is I can move this around manually like this. And whenever I stop moving it, it'll ask, do you want to change the screen position? You can either say yes or no. If you say no, it'll put it back to where it is. If you say yes, it will then update the screen's position in its attributes. So for me, I will click on no because there's an easier way to position it if you have a specific location that you want it. I can right click on the window and select a location. So for example, top left, bottom right, center right, or for us, we want dead center. So I'll click on center. It'll put it right in the center of the runtime window. And then this time I'll say yes. And then once I do that, 
I will save. And I'll snap my development back to the left. And then I'll come back here. And when I click on the first button, which is just opening the screen, we now see that it opens in the center relative to what it looks like here. Or if I click on the second motor button again, it will open it in the same position it normally would. And if we go back into development to the screen attributes of the pop-up screen, we see now that the location for the top and left have changed in order to reflect where it opens now. Additionally, in this layout, we can resize if we want. So if I wanted to make this window a little larger, I can hover over the border and then just adjust the height and the width if I want. And I will save them in those locations. And then I will save my new layout. And back in runtime, I'll click on the motor button. We now see that it opens in its new dimensions. I'll click close. And then I'll once again click on the second motor button. And once again, it opens in its dimensions that we've configured for it through the button itself. However, if I go back into the screen attributes for this, and you can shortcut that by the layout, right click and select screen attributes, we now see that we have a new width and height. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact ProFace America Technical Support by phone at 1-800-289-9266, option two, or by email, support at profaceamerica.com. You can also visit our website, profaceamerica.com, for drivers, manuals, FAQs, and other product and software information. Thanks again, and have a great day.